What's up skeptics, Thomas Westbrook here. I just released my first ever documentary style video on Holy Kool-Aid about the psychic sting op called Operation Pizza Roll. I highly recommend that you go and watch that first. This is more like bonus content. This is the full uncut interview that I did with the legendary mentalist, magician, and skeptic Mark Edward, who went undercover with Susan Gerbic to catch a cheating celebrity psychic red-handed. Given the nature of the documentary style, I basically just told him to talk and I sat back and listened. So if this doesn't really feel like a natural back and forth conversation, that's why. But enjoy. Okay, well, how it came about is uh, I have been working to try and expose some of the more nefarious methods that psychics use. And uh, I've done some other things on my own. But I'm not really as tech savvy as Susan Gerbic is. She's really good. She's also a good manager. She knows how to hustle and get people to do things. She can be pushy and aggressive. And I am not necessarily that way. I am more of a performer. I'm willing to go out and protest and be an activist. But it take, took somebody like Susan to really form a team with me and decide we're going to we are going we are going to form a team and we are going to find some sort of template that any grassroots group could use to duplicate the same kind of thing we did that works and that is conclusive and there's no holes in the protocol for the medium or the psychic to wiggle out of because that's been a challenge when we excuse me when we were both with the IIG that was one of our projects. And I spent about two and a half years trying to get something together, but it just didn't have the impetus that was needed. And that was basically the Facebook connections and the way to form these uh, personalities to use as bait to bring in uh, the medium. And fortunately, Susan and I have done a lot of other things uh, protests and so forth, and written a lot of articles, and we've done some television shows together. So we decided we wanted to find a foolproof method, method, get people involved, because that's part of the fun of it. I'm not doing it because I've got some big axe to grind with any particular psychic, and that's why the psychic in this case just happened to be the one that got in front of us, okay? So there's no personal problem uh, with with anybody in particular. It's just that we made a plan. We said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to set up these false Facebook pages. And of course, everybody who got involved with it really went out of their way to make these pages uh, real. And we had used them before on a couple of other psychics, but they weren't successful because really what we were trying to do was catch the performer, and again, what they do, I, I don't like to call them a medium or a psychic. I call them a performance artist. We were trying to catch the performance artist in using a hot read, which is not easy to do because it's generally taken from, uh, if you give them your credit card for your seat where you're sitting, they have your name and they can Google your name or they can go on Facebook or Instagram or whatever. But we really wanted to draw the person in and give him enough rope to hang his or herself. And so we worked on just that part for probably close to a year because we we tried it on one psychic and it didn't work because he didn't use hot reads. He was just doing real general cold reads. So, But along the way, because we were watching and paying attention, we learn from our mistakes. In other words, uh, not only in the actual uh, execution of what we were going to do, but also how to deal with all these different people who are going to be parts of this operation. So it's kind of like a spy network. Everybody kind of had a code name and everybody had a uh, 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 information. So that was already set up, but the idea was to try and have something that was bulletproof because 
A psychic could say, if he could say, oh, that's true. I, uh, maybe I was just reading their mind what they were thinking. So what we had to do is double blind it by making sure that some of the information that was put on the Facebook pages, Susan and I didn't go, didn't know. So when we went to the, the show, we were only given a very limited amount of facts. And the rest of it was filled out by dozens of details and photographs and pictures of cats and dogs and, you know. So the idea was if the, if the psychic took that bait, then that would be that would show conclusively that they used a Facebook because we didn't even know what he was talking about. And that became a little interesting because we had to sit there and say, yes, yes. And we didn't know what what he was talking about. So we had to agree with him, even though we, we like at one point he says, who's Buddy? And uh, I'm like looking at Susan and Susan's looking at me. And I think she said something like, isn't that your father's nickname? And and the psychic's looking at us like, and he says, that's your dog. <laughs> and I go, oh, yeah, that buddy, you know. So I think he, he smelled a rat a little bit, but he still went on. OK, see, now, I, as a performer, I would have just said, wait a minute, something's not right here, you know. But these people are greedy and they are, they, they, work in devious ways. So we were basically trying to get under his skin. And that's really important because we've learned that, you know, you can't just stand up in a psychic show and say, you're a fraud, you're phony, does nothing. You, you, you just, you cause a disturbance and you're thrown out and that's it. So we realized several operations ago that we want to get to the psychic, him him or herself. We're not interested in the audience. They've already paid their money. They have already, they're already uh, uh, vested in believing. They're already believers. So it's pointless to try and make a statement to the audience. Hopefully, some of the people who are in this audience <laughs> will see this upcoming expose and go, oh, my gosh, you know. So that's what was going on there. So and a lot of times skeptics will say, well, you're just you're just giving more belief to all those people in the audience. But we truly believe that the means justify the ends. And uh, playing playing fighting fire with fire is really the only way to do it, because there I've worked with psychics for long enough to know they have an answer for everything. And unless you can choke them with their own bait that you're not going to get anywhere. So so we set up this operation and we learned from the other two or three. One was called Operation Ice Cream Cone, which you can read about. And the other one was Operation, what was it? We named it after strange, strange food things. Operation Ice Cream Cone. Maybe Susan talked about it. What was the other one? I can't remember. Anyway, so so we set it up and we followed through and everybody got on the got on the wagon and this thing is happening. So and it took a long time for the for what we're waiting for. Did she talk to you about the newspaper article or Yeah, I mean that's really what because we we're not we don't want to preach to the choir, you know. I'm Susan and I are no longer interested in trying to get the acknowledgement or the curry favor with the greater skeptic community because they're not, for the most part, activists. And we want to be activists and actually do things. And we don't have we don't have to ask permission or say, gee, is this okay? Would it be okay if we did this? Because we ran up against that and it really pissed both of us off. So now we've set up our own situation and we're gonna have to we're gonna have to take whatever happens. But the good thing is, we, I have always said what I want to do is try and reach the biggest audience I can get. So I've done I've done this on television a few times where I've shown the methods hasn't really made a big difference. And this may not make a big difference either. But the idea is it's going into the New York Times Sunday magazine and a lot of people will read this. So I think that that 
unless you, and so we had to position ourselves. This is just as much as a, a part of the operation as the, as the uh, results. We had to position ourselves with a place that was, that was able to reach hundreds and maybe even millions of people all at once. Because Dr. Phil ain't going to do it. Dr. Oz ain't going to do it. You know, <laughs> media is not going to do it. It's got to come from a, a real news source. And fortunately, I had worked with this writer on another uh, set of set of things. So I knew that he he was going to be really good. And he's he's known all over the world. So it Hopefully it'll be worth waiting for. And God forbid something happens to Trump or something and it gets bumped. I'm just going to be like, <laughs> you know, because we're we're literally counting down the hours right now because this is supposed to come out online uh, tomorrow, Wednesday morning. And and also for in, in terms of litigation, OK, because we have heard that this particular psychic is very litigious and he's a bully and he threatens people. And I, I've been there before. I won't go into the story, but the idea is they, they're just blowing wind usually. But we figured if we go with somebody like the New York Times, they'll talk to their lawyers. You know, they will make sure that we're covered because unless this guy can... Uh, produce evidence that he verifiable e evidence that he talks to dead people, then he can't win because we're not defaming him. He's a public celebrity. See, we're not we're not taking anything away from him. In fact, the sad truth is he'll probably get even more publicity out of it. But meanwhile, the wheels turn and people like you and I and and the other uh, uh, I don't even want to call them skeptics. The other rational, critical thinkers will have a win. So that's that's a that's it basically in a nutshell. So walk me through this. You set up a Facebook page. No, more than more than we had like a dozen Facebook pages. So so you put together a network of Facebook pages prior to purchasing events to the reading. And well, you have to remember, this was this was an audience. This was an audience. It wasn't a one on one reading. What it was was a set up audience of maybe 60 people. And one of the things we've learned is if you want to get a reading from one of these people, you have to pay for a front row or maybe in the first three rows of seats. If you're in the back, they're not even going to look at you. And also, it's like faith healers, the people who are in the first three rows are generally paying, we paid, I think we paid $150 for each seat. So the psychic knows already that you've got some money to spend. So, so you know, and I've worked with other skeptic groups who are like, I don't want to pay any, any stupid psychic any money. I'm not going to do it. And it's like, well, then you're not going to get what you need to get because you're paying to get in that guy's face. So we... Uh, we got the ticket, two tickets, and we decided we were going to be husband and wife. And uh, I wore on my lapel, I wore a uh, uh, marine pin, right? Because sometimes it's cool to add a little extra bait on top of it, a little bacon on the hamburger, you know? So I had my marine pin on and Susan had, I believe she had a picture or she had something around her neck. And we dressed not like we were really elegant and had a lot of money, but like we had a little money more. You know, like when you go to the airport and you see people at the airport, they generally have a little money, but they're not they don't look wealthy. Right. So we had to, like, make our characters believable. Um, so. So I had the pin uh, and then we, of course, we had a tissue. We each had a tissue. Uh, so that we could dab our eyes, you know, from time to time and twist it nervously, you know. So we had to get in this mindset that we were a bereaved. Well, she was more bereaved than I was, but together we were there for a reason. And uh, 
and they we walked in, we got in the third row and the host comes out and says, oh, by the way, feel free to record this whole show. And we're like, OK, because <laughs> we already had one camera going, but we had an extra backup just in case. So we're like, OK, you can turn the other camera on now, you know. So all this was being taped while the guy was doing it. So, uh, no, it wasn't cold reading. The guy was really good. In fact, in the first 10 minutes, he had nothing but solid hits, which to me, as a mentalist, I was like, something ain't right here. I kept looking at Susan like, he was just nailing stuff. He nailed some people behind us. He nailed some people in the front row. But we later found out that the woman who he was so accurate with behind us had already had a reading from him. So, he, But he didn't say that, see? So she was, she came up to us after the show and she said, oh, I'm so glad he was able to reach through to your, your brother and your father. And we said, oh, yeah, thank you. And she said, I was much happier than the last time I was in the, his show. He didn't get anything. <laughs> so it's, it's really hard for us not to say, but don't you, you know, we have to stay in character. So we said, yeah, that's really tough. So you've, you've seen him before. Oh, yes, he knows all about me. So remember, the rest of the audience does not know that. And these people are so bereaved and so in shock, they won't say, wait a minute, you already told me that the last time, you know. So the medium has to keep things fresh and keep things rolling. So a lot of things happen like that that were uh, pretty amazing, pretty amazing. And I noticed there was a woman... You'll re you can read about it in Susan's article, but I was starting to look around the room a little bit, but I didn't want to look too suspicious. And there was a woman sitting across the aisle from me who was dabbing at her eyes. <laughs> and I like leaned forward and looked at her. She wasn't really crying. She was doing the same thing we were. So I knew that Sooner rather than later, he was going to get over to her and they had something set up. So she was a plant, right? But see, the average sitter, the person who goes into these things, they don't think of that. They're just thinking about themselves and what they will find out. So I thought it went, went really well. Uh, we were absolutely overjoyed when we when we compared the screenshots of the, because what we did is we got a transcript from the audio and we compared the screenshots of the Facebook pages with the transcripts from the audio. They're mere images, okay? So that was the basic thing. So, and, and I had been working with the reporter, Jack Hitt is his name, on, a, on some other things. And I went to him because he told me, if you ever figure out a way to get conclusive, you know, catch somebody red handed, I want to know about it. So I went to him and he said, OK, let's do this. So it's taken a year to get this together. And I don't want to overemphasize it. It may come to nothing, but it was very satisfying to finally understand the mechanism that can be used by anybody if they if they want to, if they have a. A grassroots group and they want to like it's fun too I mean it's really fun to play the game of of these charlatans to uh, beat them at their own game or at least try to beat them because we both know it's a world of lies and we have to start somewhere so tell me a little bit more about the woman who sat there pretending to cry did you talk to her afterwards yeah, it was a very interesting situation because we, uh, I noticed that she was wearing green because, you know, I do my own mentalist act. So I have to like take mental notes really fast and kind of sort them into this bin in my brain where I'm able to access them later if I need them. So my memory is, is constantly looking for tells. Uh, like a gambler does, if you're watching a gambler or whatever, you you train your mind to uh, situational awareness. You train your mind to look at things and watch for things that aren't right. So 
She was in the second row. She was one row ahead of us and on the aisle. And she was by herself. So, and most women who go to these things are by themselves, but an awful lot of them bring their husbands along. So since she was sitting by herself, that stuck out to me at first. Then I noticed when I looked over at her that she, she was pretending to cry. And I thought, okay, any minute he's going to swing over to her. And sure enough, that's what he did. He went to her and uh, just too perfect, right? In magic and mentalism, we have a theory called the too perfect theory, which means if everything is dead on perfect, it has to be a trick, <laughs> you know. A magic trick has to work. You can't do it halfway. But with psychic work, to me anyway, I I would never do what he did because it was just so, it was too much. You're like looking at this guy and you're saying, if he could do this, why doesn't he go to the racetrack? Or why doesn't he buy lotto numbers? Why does he have to stand up here at 8 o'clock on Friday night and do this? It's just basic logic, right? So he he he's up there and he turns to her. And she's, yes, yes, oh, that's so true. And then she's dabbing at her eyes, and I'm like, okay, fine. So we go through the whole show, which is excruciating to sit through, but that's the job. And we, since we paid the extra money, we were given the, uh, the treatment. The, uh, we got to go backstage for a private meeting with the medium, right? Not private, a whole bunch of people were back there. So we went back there and he was all aglow and he's um, he gives everybody a copy of his book and he signs them and he goes over to this woman who's in green sitting about two feet away from us. And he says to her, I'll spell your name right this time. <laughs> so I was like, what? Wait a minute. Or she said to him, maybe I'm getting it wrong. Susan would remember. She said something like, spell my name with an E, not an I this time. And we thought that was a little odd. And then Susan asked him, Susan says, you know, do you have any mediums or other, you know, uh, people who you really think highly of? And she said, he says, well, I do have a couple students. In fact, one of my students is here in the room. That's her right here. And he points to the woman in green. <laughs> so we're like... Yeah, he is training her and, and doing a pretty good job of it, too, right? So, and we're looking around the room to see if anybody else noticed that. But why would they, right? They're all fawning over him like, oh, we think you're so great, but we're just going, oh, man. He just called out his own stooge right in front of us, you know? So that's the lady in green. So that that and other things kind of, it just, it makes you angry because it's so manipulative and it's uh, it's basically acting. That's And it's not even really good acting. It's kind of, how would I put it? And this is one of the things that just drives me crazy. It's patronizingly uh, manipulative. It's really taking advantage of all those other people in the audience, it only takes one or two stooges in a group of 60 people to totally win over that audience. Because after a certain point, if, they, if those two or three people are dead on accurate and they're nodding their head yes, anything the person says will be taken as fact. So, yeah, there were, there were a couple other people. There was another couple in front of us. And that's also another clue. The people in the front rows at these things are generally people who are either special guests, friends of the medium, or they've already they paid the big ticket money because they know each other or they've just been given a free ticket. In which case, if, if they get an accurate reading from the psychic, 
they're not again, they're not going to say, oh, you told me that last time we spoke. They're just going to nod. And he just digs a little deeper. You know, he digs. He he takes for granted all the things he's already talked to that person about. And he digs a little deeper. But he makes it sound like he said, you know, I'm, I'm feeling that your father, uh, he, he traveled a lot, didn't he? Yes. Guy already knows that. So I've often said that I... I appreciate the artifice of what these guys do, but I can't stand the way that it tears people up, you know? Because for me, I'm a magician and a mentalist, and and the tricks or the wordplay or the syntax, I don't know what you want to call it. Let's call it the uh, the routines are genuinely thought out. So... And that's been the problem because I like it, but I hate it. <laughs> you know, I can appreciate it as a performance piece, but I cannot stand because generally they will do these shows. The main thing is, and everybody should know this if you're going to go to one of these shows. The plan really has always been in the history of mediumship is the performer will give a demo and then it's and it's very accurate and everything happens as it's supposed to. And then at the end, he says, if anyone would like to sign up for a reading, you know, I'm two years. It may take two years for me to get to you, but see, see my lady at the back and we'll sign you up. That's where the money is, because if 20 people go to that back table and sign up, he's got 20 times two hundred dollars or more for the future. So really what he's doing is he's doing a live advertisement for his con or her con, which is brilliant. <laughs> you know, magicians don't do that. Magicians do a kid show or something. They're like, hey, here's my business card. These guys, you know, I've even heard gypsies say, you know, I'll pray for you. Write your phone number and your name here. And if the prayer doesn't work, I'll call you, you know. And they get a list of like, by the end of the night, they get a list of 30 people. I even heard this one woman say to her husband, we are set for the next month. We got enough readings right here, you know. It's just, it's like a comedy, but it's not funny when you're on the inside track and you know what they're doing, you know. Well, ultimately they're bilking and in some cases making off with the life savings of the bereaved who are incredibly vulnerable and desperate. Oh, absolutely. I've done a couple television shows. There's, there was one woman in Santa Monica, California, who I met up with her twice, one show and then another show. She lost $150,000, lost her house, lost her marriage. Her children would never trust her because they, they would net. She was always asking them for money. And this was somebody who had a really nice lifestyle in Santa Monica and Beverly Hills, gone, everything gone. And uh, and the saddest part about that is a year later, I was doing some other show and the same person was there. And I said, you're not still seeing psychics, are you? And she goes, oh, no, 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 I don't do that anymore. Oh, no, no, I have a life coach now. And I'm like, no. <laughs> so... People want someone to talk to. That's all it is. They want someone to listen to them and care. But So did the life coach wean her off of psychics by saying, give money to me instead? <laughs> That's what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't know that for sure, but what is more likely that, I mean, what is a life coach? A life coach is somebody who tells you what to do with your life. So I don't see there's that much different other than an exercise or diet regime that makes them any different because nobody is a nobody gets a degree in life coach unless it's from some phony university or something. So I had to just kind of shake my head. So she was getting back up on her feet, but she was still dependent. And that's what that's what I think is, you know, I mean, I don't I can't say it's wrong because people do it and people can do whatever they want with their money. But for me, I'd like to at least say, hey, you know, buyer beware. 
you know, before you lose $150,000, uh, you might want to learn about what cold reading is. So, and I just don't think there's any of that going around. Although, thank you, John Oliver. I saw that. <laughs> you know, it seems like there's a little bit of a convergence of uh, anti-psychic uh, energy going around, and I, I'm I'm happy to see it. We need more of that, and I think the best thing about it is humor. Okay, if it was a serious skeptic program where everybody was just a naysayer and all that, nobody would watch that. But when you when there's laughter and there's just you see the foibles and how ridiculous these people are. I think that really makes a difference. Unfortunately, it can also work. You can get a you can get a back. What do they call it? A the backfire effect. Backfire. In other words, this this John Oliver thing could end up inculcating a whole new crop of psychics who say, "Look how easy it is. These people are on television. They're on Doctor Phil. You know." But we have to do what we have to do, and and Susan and I. And many others in our tight little group are committed. And that's what it takes. Because, again, we, are, we could care less about the audience. We want that psychic to know that if he steps out on the stage, there might be two or three of us in the audience. Okay? And I know, and I won't, well, I guess I could mention another name, but there was another psychic who... I literally, I got thrown out of the Biltmore Hotel in Los Angeles, okay? And that guy was terrified because he realized there were people in the audience who were not buying into his game. And part of our strategy is, because I'm, I'm a performer, if I, if I do a show and there's a heckler in the audience, it throws you off your game, right? It, you can't be as confident as you were if somebody's heckling you or you know you have like some something that could happen in the audience that you can't control. So part of what we try and add into this is that uneasy feeling on all psychics, whoever you are out there, once people understand how to do this and they want to do it, you're going to be in the in the crosshairs. So think twice before you you know, do any decide to suddenly become a psychic because the more people watch these things and pay attention, the more chances there's going to be somebody in the audience who's going to take you to task. I mean, we have we have to believe that, you know, because and if people have stopped us when we did we needed we did a John Edward protest and people we went in front of the place and I said, I'll give you a free reading. You don't even have to go in there. And they're like, don't you guys have anything better to do tonight? And we look at each other and go, nope, we sure don't. <laughs> you know? And they're like, oh, they're all disgruntled and they go in. You know, they go in anyway. And it's like they're saying, damn it, no one is going to stop me from throwing away my money if I want to. You know, <laughs> You know, the police came, they did us this whole number. It's a great video. You, you can look it up uh, on uh, YouTube. Uh, we did it with Emery Emery. So, but I mean, the, the point is, we want to plant the seeds of doubt. Because somebody's got to do that pretty soon. Otherwise, it, you know, it might already be too late. You know, it might already just be salmon swimming upstream. But at least I can look at myself in the mirror uh, in the morning and not feel like uh, I'm not doing something. And that's basically what I tell people. Do something. Don't just, don't just go to a skeptic conference and sit around listening to people talk, 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 talk. I, I don't need to, I, you need to do something. You know, people talk and complain and yeah, you meet people and you, you make, you make, you network. And they're all good and well, but really it's time to get out in the streets. That's what I think. And, uh, you know, despite the fact that there's all these libel laws, uh, you know, it, you, still, you still can do a lot. And it's very satisfying. And, it, and, and you feel like you are 
part of the chain, part of the solution and not the problem. And so that's what I would say to anybody who's watching and listening this, to this. I mean, how disgusting can it be when a psychic says that someone's missing child is murdered and will never be found and they turn up alive in Chicago? <laughs> it's just, ah, it's, it's wrong. And, you know, for, for the, the people who give, the, uh, give them platforms like the daytime TV shows, they are partly responsible. And, and I have heard of people who have gotten, well, it's actually kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? It's kind of uh, apocryphal, but, you know, there have been people who committed suicide when someone told them that they're never going to see their husband again or their wife again. And then they turn up. I actually did an interview with the magician Paul Zen on a while back. Oh, yeah. I know, Paul. Yeah, I didn't release it because the audio was basically unusable. Uh, I might release it as bonus content at some point. But he told me about a psychic who had told a man that his wife or kid or someone was waiting for um, him to join them. So the guy went out and committed suicide to be with them. Right. It was actually a great Alfred Hitchcock Presents episode. <laughs> <laughs> which is called, um, oh, what is it called? Anyway, it, that is what the story is. What it is is the medium, the, the, the father wants to see his son who was killed in the war, and the medium convinces him that it's so beautiful on the other side and that you will see your son on the other side that the guy finally says, okay, and you're going with me. <laughs> That's the end of the show, right? Kills first, he kills her, then he kills himself. So I mean, what's it called? It is called the Evil of Adelaide Winters, and it is an Alfred Hitchcock hour, and uh, it's pretty chilling. Because now I've told you the ending, but you know how Hitchcock is—you don't see that coming. You're like you're thinking that the police are going to catch her because she's really bad. You know, she's really a bad psychic. But uh, and her partner who helps her set up and does all the dirty work, he says, that guy's going to break. I'm out of here. So he leaves. But she's left uh, and she thinks she's going to this guy's going to marry her and she's going to get all of his money. But instead, he says, no, we're going to be with my son now. So. The point is, none of this turns out well, <laughs> you know, it really doesn't. And yeah, lying rarely does. No, it doesn't. And, and uh, it's just lying and deceit has become an accepted business practice. And uh, it's, we got to start somewhere. And it's, to me, it's just way beyond ridiculous. Randy told me off camera that Montel Williams told him backstage that, of course, he knew that Sylvia Brown was fake. Uh, he knew that all of it was BS, but it brought in the views and it brought in the ratings. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And people like that, have I, they have sort of a cosmic blood on their hands, as far as I'm concerned, because it, it may not be the specific psychic they had on, as their guest on their show, but they are supporting that platform. And therefore, people who do commit suicide or do... Like, what was the, the woman who, Sylvia Brown said this daughter was... Yeah, she said Amanda Berry was dead. Right. And her mother, they said she died of a broken heart. And how fucked up is that? I mean, she probably didn't die of a broken heart, but... But if she gave up hope and she was already sick, it can... Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, these are the, these are you, these are the exceptions and not the rules, meaning... Generally, people just go, oh, that was an interesting show. Ha ha, you know, forget about it. And they go about their daily work. But if you really look at it or you look at a website like uh, like uh, what's the harm, you know, what's the harm dot org dot net. I'm sorry, I always get that wrong. Tim Farley's page. You can see you can see these individual situations listed one after another. So there is a harm to it. But. Well, not really, but there is a harm to it. However, I think we have to choose our battles. I'm not, I'm not out to get the carnival tarot reader. 
In fact, I love reading tarot cards. It's fun. But if they're getting a hook in you or trying to, that's where I draw the line. Or they say they're talking to dead people. It's like, okay, fine, you know. <laughs> you can stop now. But if I'm, if I'm uh, at a Halloween uh, pumpkin festival or something and someone's giving tarot readings, I'll go get a reading. It's free, harmless. But even with that, and Randy doesn't like that either, even with that, you're still supporting superstition. So it's kind of hard sometimes because, you know, where you draw the line between entertainment and, and, and promoting superstition can be very difficult. And Randy and Ray Hyman, I'm sure you know who Ray Hyman is. Oh, yeah. I did an interview with him, too. Yeah. So, I mean, he used to do readings. He was... See, I've been, I've been doing the rounds. <laughs> Ray, Ray Hyman used to do readings. He was really good at it. And because of that, he got into psychology and the rest is history. He started the modern skeptic movement. So, you know, sometimes you have to experience this, the awfulness of this to be able to make sense of it. Otherwise, it seems harmless. It seems like, what's the harm? But when you've seen it from the inside, like... I don't, I don't think it's something I would brag about that I could make someone break down in tears, you know, but I can do it. I know how to do it. But is that a skill or is that something that you learn when you work for the CIA or something? It's almost that nefarious. When you, when you use a person's emotions that way, it's just like it's the most violating thing or one of them. It's on the list, you know. If you guys like what I'm doing with my channel, promoting scientific skepticism, critical thinking, and free thought, please consider supporting my work at patreon.com slash holy Thank you to everyone for your ongoing support.